Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Meshwaraha, Guru Eva Param Brahma, Asai Shri Gurave Namaha, Chinmayam Yati Atsarvam, Trilokyam Sacharacharam, at padam darshitam yena asmai shri gurave nama kwameva mata chapita kwameva kwameva bandhu sa sakha kwameva kwameva vedyad radinam Vame Vame Sarvam Vameva Sarvam Vamade Pratibhanti stitani cha Yatrai bo pashamam yanti Asai satyatvane namaha So where are we in our text? Uh, the second verse of chapter 18, page 180. Help us out, please, Ganesh. Bakyan Abhyantaram Shaver Sarshan Parijahat Kramar Tata Samanasas Taidian Kamsha Kamshamano Pachintaya. Gradually, he abandoned all contacts, external as well as internal. Then desiring the firmness of his mind, he reflected as follows. So again, what is the process? This is again an abridgment, so we get uh, an abridged version of sadhana. But letting go of all the contacts with the senses. Gaining firm. I, uh, watched a wonderful YouTube video over the weekend. It was a documentary on Sri Ramana Maharshi. It was quite extensive. And uh, what I found interesting is at just before he turns 16, he comes home, he has this initial near Vikalpa Samadhi. He realizes his self-nature. He just has this incredible distaste for the world, and he feels drawn to the holy mountain Arunachala. He goes there, and won't go into too many of the particulars, but essentially he ends up living in a crypt uh, uh, shrine under the Tiruvannamali um, temple for years in silence. He threw all his clothes into a tank before this and took the one dhoti he had and ripped off the bottom and made a loincloth about it. And they weren't clear, maybe someone else knows how long he was in silence. But it was like 11 years, something like that. It might have even been longer. Just sitting in meditation sitting in meditation all day into the night. If no one brought him food, he didn't eat. In the beginning, they didn't know whether he was some crazy kid or a sage. 
kids would throw stones at him and he just ignore it. This tense, tense introversion. Now, a Kapaswan of this caliber, they're rare. Of course, the deep samadhi that he had, very rare. But you get the idea. What is the price tag for steady wisdom? We have to give up the world. It doesn't mean we have to leave. Some of us may choose to do that. It means we give up our concern. We give up our attachment. Any thoughts on this before we go on? In that example, wasn't he kind of leaving the world? He did. But then to some degree, he returned to it. He ended up having an ashram. He ended up speaking again and teaching and doing darshan. He would be involved with the cooking in the kitchen. Those tapas that he did. But each one of us has our own journey. We can't say that his way is what's right for all, every one of us. But the underlying principle is we do have to give up our concern for the world. His mother came and said, oh, oh, come back, we need you. By the way, she eventually came and was one of his disciples. Family. Friends. Again, we don't have to leave the world. We just have to let go of our attachment. All right, next one. Ahotu chanchalam chittam satyakritam api satyakritam apikshanat Khatat patam upayati patat chakatam upkatam. Ah, the mind is indeed unsteady in a moment, even though withdrawn. From a vessel, it approaches a garment, and from a garment, a spacious cart. It jumps from, that is, it jumps from one object to another. So here are every person yogi has the same kind of experience you and I have of meditation. He says a cow, a garment, what was the third one he said? I can't remember that. But anyway, you and I, oh, I, think about, I think about work, I think about cooking, I think about friends, I think about yesterday, I think about tomorrow. So all of us start with that. Indeed, at the end of the sixth chapter on meditation, Arjuna says to Krishna, Oh, Krishna, controlling the mind is like trying to control the wind. Krishna says, that's true. It can be done through not just willpower. The way to control the mind is to get out of the mind. Of course, I think the best of all practices for that is the one that Bhagawan uh, Ramana Maharshi gives us. Whatever thought arises, to whom did this occur? To me. Koham. Who am I? Keep turning the mind over and over. And as you notice that chid akasha, that space of awareness, the phony eye of the ego, the counterfeit eyes, 
falls and disappears because it's nothing to be. So let's see what this fellow does with this agitated mind. Going on. Chittam Adhesh Paho Yati Padatesh Viva Markata Aham Chetana Mityeva Chittatpam Manyase Prutha. Alas, the mind moves among objects just as a monkey moves among trees. Mind, you vainly think. I alone am sentient or conscious. So my problem is, I think the mind is sentient and conscious. So what's happening here, let's break it down a bit. When we study Viveka Chudamani and we go through the section on the Pancha Kosha, the five koshas, one of the sections is just fascinating is the Vijnana Maya Kosha, the intellectual sheath. The elements that comprise the intellectual sheath are the organs of perception, their subtlest form, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, buddhi, in And karta, the sense of doership, sometimes called ahankriti, ahankara, we usually translate that as evil. What does this function in the intellectual sheath do? It Tributes to the self the qualities of the not self. First and foremost, I think I'm my body. I'm tall, I'm short, I'm fat, I'm thin, I'm old, I'm young, I'm male, I'm female, I'm ugly, I'm attractive. But then the subtle things I'm loving, not so loving angry, sad. Then in the intellect, I'm successful, I'm a failure, lovable, and lovable. At the subtlest level, I think I have a mind, and my mind is conscious and sentient and aware. I think of consciousness like a possession. Like I have a hand, like I have a foot. I think I have consciousness, like it's a, a part of possession. And actually, it's not true. You do not have awareness. You are awareness. What you have our thoughts, images, memories. So the very substratum of the ego, I jam, I got up this morning, I went to lunch with my friend Dan, blah, 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 blah. Well, but what is that? That's taking the attributes of the body and its behaviors and attributing them to the self. Now, what's myself? If at any point I bother just to thin the mind, we have this term that we've gotten already, tanu manasaha, thinness of mind. Where I can begin to see the beginning and the end of a thought. Introvert my attentive faculty. Really investigate. Well, who am I? I cannot find a gym. Nothing there. 
yet that no thing shines. It's your awareness. So let's see how his inquiry proceeds. Going on, next verse. Atyanta bhinnayo ekyam na pichin manaso shatha karatahan jiva ityapitya jabhavana rog. There is no identity between consciousness and the mind, which are completely different. Abandon even the idea and the individual soul, born out of egotism. So again, back to Swamiji's spiritual algebra, M mind equals A awareness plus TF, thought flow. I take thought flow and I move it to the other side of the equation, M mind minus thought flow equals pure awareness. So that's all there is to the mind. It's the movement, it's the flow of thought. I don't see the mind as some lump of awareness. What I do is illuminate thoughts, feelings, images, memories, etc. I am ever unattached. The thoughts, the feelings, the sensations never touch. Now, what he's doing in this verse is giving us the locus of the problem. This scripture thunders, both bondage, why does he do this way? Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. The self is ever free. What is my bondage? My bondage is because of ignorance. I think I'm a person. Essentially, I think I'm my body. What is liberation? When the mind, technically it happens in the Vijnana Maya Puja, in the intellectual sheath, gives up this false superimposition. So like the tail end of this verse, relationship to you something ever in front of you why should I have concern now amazingly something happens once I start to get out of the mind the mind starts to settle down because the energy of egoism is gone. Any thoughts on this? Uh, Jim, um, could yes. you repeat that? Could you please repeat that last line, the energy of? Yes, it's the egoism that puts the energy in the mind. When I am having this problem and I am having that problem and I've got to avoid this and I want to have that. It's all driven by this deeply rooted belief that I'm a person. And I need all this stuff. This is serious business. But when we get out, it's like the table over there saying, I need to be polished. I need you to wipe up the salsa. Well, okay, Mr. Table. I'm not the table. The table talking to me is kind of an illusion. Does 
Did that make it a little clearer? Yes, Jim, thank you. Good question, good question. Jim, this is Feng. I've got another question as well. Please. What is the best way to get out of the mind? Witnessing. Take on the practice of Sakshi Baba. Live with this truth. I'm not the body. I'm not the feelings. I'm not the thoughts. And give up concern for it. Now, there's a caveat here. We talked about this last night in Gita, if you remember. I quoted Ram Das, who said, you've got to be somebody before you're nobody. And when Jung said only a healthy ego can die at one level of our sadhana, we're concerned with the mind and its reactivity and its issues. That's in the very early stages of sadhana. That's not what the scripture is addressing. This scripture is addressing when you pretty much, uh, we're not saying you have to resolve all your family of origin issues. You're never gonna. When you finish with this life, you've got the last time. When you calm down enough that you can start practicing the Sakshi Baba. And this is the Viveka. This is the discrimination between the real and the unreal, the self and the not self. Then comes the vairagya. I let go of my attachment. People, places, things, and conditions, any idea of self. Whatever comes through you. Shankara's metaphor is you want to have a mind like a wicker basket that you pour water in, just let everything pass through. Empty, empty, empty. chitta, the goddess. Empty mind. Excellent question. I hope that was useful. Thanks, Jim. It was. Thank you. Next verse. Jim, can I ask a question? Please. Oh, I love um, it. We're getting questions. <laughs> I'm curious about like what your thoughts are on the process of getting to what you just described. Because when you mentioned kind of taking on the attitude of the witness, like I can intellectually do that and I can practice that, but I know that like sometimes my emotions or feelings or thoughts don't quite catch up to that. Like I, I can think it, but I don't, but, I, but I'm feeling a separate way. So I yeah. get it, yeah. I get it. Now understand witnessing is not a tool to make your feelings better. Let me repeat that. Witnessing is not a tool to make your feelings better. It's not another form of like reframing or anything like that to make stuff okay. Mm. It's about seeing the truth. So for example, if you're on a, a Vipassana retreat and you get an ache in your back, what do you do about the ache in the back? Who here has been on a Vipassana retreat? Have you, Alan? What do you do if you get an ache in your back? I was just thinking back a little bit. Like you would just not think about it. Right? You just be with it. But you don't get caught up in, oh, my awful back. I'm going to go someplace else and get away with it. After a while, that becomes exhausting. You just, okay, the backwards. You're present to it. You witness it. And then what you see ultimately is it passes. Does that make it a little clear? Yeah. Now, when you can quit believing your mind, it does turn the volume up. So I marry this with another tool. It's a spiritual 
axiom that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the klesha, the affliction, the dosha, the defect. I have the attachment. I have the control issue. And most importantly, I have some form of identification. So we have to start with giving up victimization. At an absolute level. That does not mean that the world and its people don't oftentimes behave quite badly. But nobody has the power to make me feel anything. And the opposite is true too. I'm not that powerful either. I can't make anybody feel anything. But if we're in a victim mentality, they create, they cause my feelings. You hurt my feelings. Wait, 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 wait. You made me annoyed. So you're at a meeting. Who's ever had that feeling? Same people you're at a meeting with, you know, say once a week at work, and just all of a sudden, everybody annoys you. I had that feeling. But what does a yogi do? Ah. Oh. It's not them. What's going on with me? Pay attention. Witness. Some old car broker. Not figure it out. Annoyed at the girl. Cold. Passionate. Interested awareness. Attention it goes away. Eventually it does not. Now, this is work we don't just do in our meditation seat. Understand this point. This is going on for everybody, but for us yogis, it's conscious. We know what's happening. We have vasanas, those unconscious tendencies, which emanate energy into the world. And they draw to us experience, karmically. So if an upsetting person comes into my life, I did it. You get that. And there's always one lesson to learn. Quit reacting. Let it go. Don't take it seriously. Let it pass through. And if we miss the opportunity, to practice the Vairagya. Don't worry. It will come around again. Who here got upset at something this week? Shilpa, did you? Tell me it's the first time you've had this feeling. Yeah? Have there been similar circumstances where you've had the same emotional reaction? Yeah. Yeah. Guess who's doing it? <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We have no chance of being free from it unless we un internalize that and understand it. As long as I think they're doing it, my only attempt will be to play whack a mole with the world. I need to get rid of that person, and I need to get rid of that person, and I need to change that job, and I need to move to that house. And if we're honest, we will see 
how it always fails. Because it's never out there. I draw to myself whatever my vastness, my attachments are producing. And the lesson is always the same. Let go and keep your heart open. Easy to say, or simple to say, not easy to do. But until we internalize that spiritual axiom, always going to be doing battle with the world. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't act. That doesn't mean you may not need to speak truth to power in your job situation. Say, oh, me. You don't give a rat's ass, so you're fearless. Last boss at my church job was dishonest and unethical and a priest. And he used to manage by fear and intimidation. <laughs> Sorry, Father. <laughs> so when he would pull a stud, I would take him aside and say, Father, that's unethical. You know, and then we talk it through. You know, and he just was not used to people speaking to him that way. I didn't yell at him or anything. But I wasn't afraid of him firing me. He fired me, fired me. So what? I work for God. So Yogi also learns to be fearless. Swamiji was incredible. Most fearless person I've ever met. But all of it is rooted in this constant attempt to identify with the ground of being, not the body, not the karka, the do. Is that useful? Yeah. This is real yoga here. This is where the rubber hits the road. All right, next verse. Jim, I have, sorry, I have a follow-up question to what she asked. Don't be sorry. Yeah. I may have told you this, we don't want any stupid questions. And the only <laughs> stupid question is the one you don't ask. Right. Swamiji used to say that. <laughs> so, um, boy. Uh, you mentioned in response to her question the attitude of the witness and um, so one of the difficulties I have faced is that um, cultivating the uh, identity of, of uh, a witness it itself leads to a kind of a subtle form of ego which uh, you know very clearly then demarcates a distinction between me and the universe and that has its own problems so yeah. That's my question. In, in the end, this jiva bhavana, this attitude or feeling of being the witness, you are right. It is a practice of the ego. But it's a useful one. By all means, be a yogi. That's what Krishna says in Gita. If you cannot know your Brahman, by all means, be a yogi. So at this level, where we're still identified with the ego, practice being the witness, practice this detachment and dispassion. Now, if you wish, you can then maybe go out in nature and take up the practice by seeing beauty in nature. All is Brahman. But our problem is, I think I'm a person 
and I'm connected with this person and I'm annoyed or angry at that person. That's not useful. Now, I did not make up the practice of Sakshi Baba. It's in all the scriptures today. Right. So what I would recommend is set aside perhaps your philosophical concerns with it and try it for 30 days. And if mm -hmm. it doesn't bring you some peace of mind, quit doing it. Again, be a spiritual scientist. Right, right. But contempt prior to investigation is unscientific. Mm -hmm. And those of you in academia are surrounded by people with contempt prior to investigation. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yes. And we'll be intuitively led to the practices that work best for us. Mm. But Sakshi Baba is a very good saying in the higher intellect, practicing, I am not the body, not the mind, not the thoughts, I'm not the ego. I watch egoism rise and fall. But if you can see egoism rise and fall, you are something other than the ego. Mm. Was that useful? Yes, Jim. I think the, the suggestion Great. of nature was very nice. Yes. <clears throat> Next verse. Etava deva te rupam. Etava deva te rupam. Yavat nasti vicharanam. Vichare no prashantam tum. Alu kena tamo yatha. As long as there is no investigation. So long is there a form for you. That is, you exist, you exist only so long as there is no investigation of your nature. First, extinguished by investigation, just as darkness by light. So he's going on to that same principle that Ramana Maharshi talked about that I shared. The ego, one of the words we have for it in scripture is chit chaya. Chaya in Sanskrit means reflection or shadow. I think in Hindi, it just means shadow, right? Yeah. Yeah. It has both meanings in Sanskrit. So the point is, the ego is a shadow self. It only appears to exist when we don't investigate. It. So if I look down here and I see the shadow of my feet on the carpet and all oh, the shadows aren't very clear. And then I shine a very bright light on the shadow. What happens to the shadow? Shadow can't exist when it's alone. It's caused by the obscuration of light. So the self is shining on the subtle intellect that has the silly idea that I'm a person. And as that again projects out into the world, I do this, I do that, I experience this, I experience that. But if we turn the mind inward and go looking for this personal sense of self, this jiva, it falls. So this is why vicharena, by means of investigation. That's the thing. Keep turning the attention. Koham. Who am I? Or for you Tamilians, Nam Yar. That's actually what the, the title of the book was. I think that, that Ramana Maharshi wrote. 
who am I? We can prove it to you. You all see the room from your viewpoint. I see the room from my viewpoint. You are aware of your body. I'm aware of mine. We're aware of your feelings and thoughts. I'm aware of my feelings and thoughts. But if you introvert your attentive faculty, Still the mind as much as you can. Who are you? You see, there's nothing there. Bernard Allen, the Didar Shilpa did. They can only exist when the mind is looking outward. The Upanishad says, the Lord created the senses with outgoing tendencies. Here what we really mean is the mind. The eye behind the eye, the ear behind the ear, the tongue behind the tongue, etc. When it's always focused outward. Now, listen carefully. The psychotherapist will say, look within, what are you feeling? For a yogi, that's still looking out. Looking at a feeling, looking at a thought, looking at an image. That's still looking out. Find out who the looker is. And that phony self, that shadow self, dissolves. Now, the difference between the dreamer and the waker is a gross shift in identity. Lying in bed, you're having a wild dream, and the alarm goes off. Ring. All of a sudden, you shifted from the dream ego with its dream body and its dream world to the waker. The shift between the waker ego and knowing I am from though profound, is incredibly subtle. It's just a shift. Listen to the traffic. Who hears it? There's just this vast, empty ocean of awareness. Again, you do not see the self like an object. It's like trying to see your eyes or trying to taste your tongue or trying to shine a flashlight on its own batteries. Yet you are. Next verse. Swaplan ye bavatish teham. Tud yarupa pade stipa. Hantain triagana yuyam kim. Erathakama kula. I shall abide in my own self, being established in the abode of the nature of Turiya, or the fourth state of consciousness. Alas, organs of senses, why are you agitated in vain? So, here 
because he's got his attention deeply introverted, he's withdrawn his attention from the world of phenomena. He's begun to get the taste of deep peace. Now, scripture uses the term Turiya, which is borrowed from Mandukya Upanishad. In the Agama Prakarna, the scriptural portion, it says, Om, the word is all this, meaning the phenomenal word. Om is beyond all this, meaning the end. Om is divided into Chatushpada, four quarters. A, U, A, Sai. A is the waking state. U is the dream state. Ma, is the deep sleep state and the silence is the Turiya, the form, which is the consciousness that witnesses the play of Ah uh, and Ma, waking dream of deep sleep. And in Samadhi, when even they are taken away. It is not another mind state. I'm going to go into deep meditation. I'm going to be rocked into Turiya, the fourth dimension. No, you are the fourth. You are other than any mind state. Very, very clear about this, so that we give up attempts to get whacking my mind into some exalted spiritual experience, thinking that's what it's about. Oh. Give up your concern for any. Next verse. Pichitam samadhaya tastho aspandite griya antareva shashamasya kramena prana santati. Concentrating the mind thus, he remained without making his senses throb or move. Gradually, the flow of his prana, the white layer, just became calm or was just extinguished. So he begins to approach Samadhi. Now, again, remember Yoga Vasishta gives equal weight to Raja Yoga, the eight limbs, the yoga described in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, and the white, the Vedanta, the path. Knowledge. But samadhi is discussed in both scriptures. So in Shankara, we look at it this way. First comes what we call Savikalpa Samadhi. So let's pull these words about. Sa means with, vikalpa is a movement, a vimarsha, a perturbation in the mind. 
The etymology for samadhi that I like, sama equal the mind. Absolute quiescence of mind. Why I still have the perception of some thought and the phenomenon. So when you come to class, working with the knowledge, and you get tuned up, and your mind gets very quiet. That's Sabi Gopal Samadhi. You're in Samadhi. From that state, we keep practicing. We keep practicing. Keeping the energy intensely interwoven, absorbing the mind and the self as much as we can, giving up all the attachments, all the identifications. Some moment. All the vasanas arrive. The mind slips into nirvikalpa where the distinction between knower, knowing, and known is gone. The mind. In one of these videos on Ramana Maharshi, he says, most of the time I have no thoughts. <laughs> Even if it's just for a moment, And when the mind returns, it's like, oh, there's nobody there. Now, this is not the end of the journey. Now you have something real with which to work. So Shankara says, even after realization of the truth, there exists a strong impression that one is the doer and the enjoyer, which is the cause for rebirth. Here by rebirth, he means I re-identify. This needs to be conscientiously rooted out, steady, Continuous identification with the self. Annihilation of the vasanas here and now is termed liberation by awareness. So you know if egoism returns and you get identified with it. No touch to you until you are sthita. That's the term Krishna uses. Person steady. Now, Nirvikalpa Samadhi is not the highest state. When we return from Nirvikalpa, we not only know, oh, aham brahmasmi, I am that brahman, but this world of name and form is just like images in a mirror, pratibhimba is the term the scriptures use over and over again, reflections in a mirror. So then if your mind is active, like Uday or Shweta, I guess, was saying about 
King Janaka, was it you or was it your wife? I can't remember. I think, I think it was Shweta. It was last night, yes. So he was a man of the highest wisdom, active in the world. So much he was like that. Inside, Shunya Chitta, Or you may be like Bhagawan, Mahana Maharshi, who just lay on his couch and deep Occasionally he'd open his eyes and look somewhere in the darkness. Real teaching is done in silence. So sahaja, or natural or continuous samadhi, is where you function in the world and effortlessly never forget your subtle nature. You never take the world. All right, going on, next verse. Kathaiva tishthatas tasya sambat sarashatatrayam kayohi vitahavyasya pantenor vitale krutaha. The body of that vitahavya remaining just so for 300 years was indeed placed within the surface of the earth by means of mud. That is, the body got buried under the earth. So, Pitahavya stays in Nirvikopa Samadhi. So, either earthquakes, mudslides buried him. I don't know, but for 300 years he was deep in Samadhi. Again, this is literary device. But many yogis are fond of samadhi and stay in deep samadhi for extended periods of time. When we're in samadhi, we're oblivious to the external. Let's see what happens underneath that pile of mud going on. Varsha Krayashate Yate So Buddhyata Swayam Munihi Samvedeva Syatam Deham Jagro Jagraho Vinipiditam. When 300 years had elapsed, that sage woke up by himself. Consciousness alone took hold of his body, which was squeezed by the earth. So after 300 years, all of a sudden he wakes up and he's underneath all this dirt. I want to back up to uh, verses uh, a few uh, uh, ago that we did. He mentioned that his, his breath became quiet, the prana became interior and stuff like that. Do not think you're becoming spiritual if you can hold your breath for long periods of time. If you're practicing Raja Yoga and you're practicing Pranayama, do the exercise as you've been instructed by a bona fide qualified teacher. But you may find in deep meditation, 
your breath slowing way down or getting much more shallow. If you're focused on what's happening with your breath, you're probably not focused on the self. What we want to do is draw our attention. And that's the truth about any other kind of sensation. Oh, I felt Kundalini going up and down. Okay. It's just energy in the body. Buzzing in my third eye. Am I getting close to enlightenment? <laughs> it's probably a cat. Don't stop it. But that's not it. Notice it. It is an external phenomenon. Return the breath. All right. So after 300 years, he wakes up. Let's see what happens to him. Meaning for you and me. We have a period of meditation where we may be very deep, and after a time, we return to objective awareness. Going. Na bhut prana paris pandaha sarvachin sarvachidra varo dhata putpati praudi ma sadhya pridye vanu babhu vasah. There was no movement of the prana or the vital air because of the restraint or blockade of all openings. That is the two nostrils, the two eyes, the two ears, the mouth, and the organs of generation and excretion. So, <coughs> having reached okay, full, sorry, having reached full growth or development and in coming into existence, he experienced that prana only in the heart. So he wakes up, but because he's buried in mud. His ears are blocked, his nose is blocked, his butt is blocked, his eyes are blocked. So there's just enough prana for him to be aware that, you know, his heart has started up deeply interior, but now back in the waking state. Going on. Kaila Sadro Munir Bhutva Sambat Sarashatam Tataha. Vidya Dharatvam Indratvam Shambhoscha Ganatam Tataha Pratibhasa Vashadeva Pratibhasa Vashadeva Anubhuya Swayam Ichaya Prajan Masubhavan Dehan Drishtva Chinta Vashakunaha Panchamangam Imam Deham then having been a sage in the Kailasha mountain for hundred years and having experienced that after the state of a celestial being, Indra, Lord of the demigods and the attendant of Shambhu, the destructive aspect of God of the Trinity, at his will on them and on account of what flashed across his mind at once and having seen the bodies produced from previous births, Vitahavya, subject to an anxiety, entered the solar orb again for lifting up or saving his body immersed in mud. So what he does is here, his mind goes through various imaginations of various celestial beings. He remembers past incarnations, just like you and I remember dreams. And then finally he comes back into, okay, I'm in my body and here I am covered in mud. Let's see what he does. Bhanuna Tabhyanu Pyatam Vita Havya Midham Vita Vita Havya Vidham Manaha Pravishya Pingala Karam Gatva Vindhyasya Kandaram Udhritya 
Then the mind named Vita Havya, permitted by the solar de deity, having entered the reddish brown form of light, going to the cave of the Bindhya mountain and raising from the hollow receptacle of the earth his own body, entered it. So he comes back with an awareness of his individuality and he comes back animates the body that was there in the hole and wakes up. Going on. Tata Sratva Japam Kritva Sampu Jepcha Divakaram Vita Havyo Yatha Purvam Pragnaya Bhushito Babhau. Then, having bathed and performed Japa or repetition of sacred words and having worshipped the solar deity, Vita Havya, shown as before, adorned by intelligence. So he comes out of this hole, probably pretty stinky, takes a bath, does ritual that was appropriate for his particular caste and station in life. And he's returned to waking state reality in a physical body. So again, what we're going to start addressing is, okay, after you've had this deep and profound experience of samadhi, maybe for a long time, maybe just an instant, and the mind returns and you have technically pratyabhijnana, recognition, the aha, oh, I get it, I'm not a person. This is what it now, some saints at the moment of near being called the Samadhi, they drop dead. But if the body has some prarabdha to fulfill, they come back to the body and function in the way. Now, how many more verses in this chapter? Do I have time to talk about? There's lots of verses, but we are end of we are at the end of the section. How many more in this section? This is the last. We just finished the last verse. Okay, so Shankar addresses the question: Is there proud of the karma for the saint? Proud of the karma meaning the actions of the body. We see saints doing various things. Some are up in the Himalayas, very reclusive. Others are active in the world. Swamiji started a big, huge mission, wrote 40 books, etc. What describes the different worldly activities of the realized soul? It's their proud of the karma, the karma of this particular body in this particular life. Listen carefully. The teaching of prarabdha is for you and me who are in ignorance so we have an understanding of what we see for the man or woman of realization they know they're not the body self has no product think are you in the dream or is the dream in you? It feels like I'm in the dream. But the dream is in you. And if you dream about a hippopotamus, when you wake up in the morning, there's not a hippopotamus in bed with you, at least not for most of us. So was the hippopotamus of your dream really there? So for the jnani, how can I say there's prarabdha for something that's dreamlike? Because 
watch. The mind of the person of realization is gone. It's empty. But the Lord will use it, that particular equipment, as he sees fit. That may mean being a housewife. It may be being a teacher. It may mean being a recluse. <clears throat> but to the person of steady wisdom, it makes no difference. None whatsoever. All right, any questions on this? Really good section. We'll end here tonight. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namuda Chate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Yonamaha Hari Om. Om. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat>